In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Welcome to our uh, first Sunday of the Blessed Month of Tooth sermon um, on Zoom. Uh, today we're going to explore um, these different themes today. We're talking about St. John the Baptist. We're talking about beginning of the year. We're talking about a spiritual life, a life in Christ. And we, and we contemplate how St. John points us to that life in Christ. And so the theme of the month of Tooth is the friends of God, right? Um, that Christ is friends to tax collectors and sinners, and he's as well as, as the friends of the, to the righteous, right? And so we explore his best friend today a little bit, and we'll, we'll contemplate on a little bit of, of the message of St. John the Baptist, and then we'll go into um, some contemplations related to uh, the Feast of Nairuz. And so uh, this month, we're given examples of repentance found in different kinds of people and from different kinds of backgrounds. We go to the sinful woman later on this, this month, Zacchaeus, the rich lawyer, and then we talk about St. John the Baptist. And St. John's example and his message of repentance is really essential for, for, coming, uh, for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, think of the last message of the year. Think of, you know, we have the little month and the, and the one before that, the fourth Sunday. The, the idea there was to repent, to watch, to prepare with realizing that we are the chief of sinners. And then with that said, now look at the first message of the year, of the, the first Sunday of the Coptic New Year. The Lord came to the world to save sinners, and, and I am the chief of them, and those who repent. You know, our, our Lord says something in the gospel today that is just remarkable. He says, uh, for I say to you, among those born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist, but he who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. So the question I have to start with is, how many of us wish to be great in the eyes of God? You know, I, I, I wish that, and I hope that any serious believer would make it their central goal in life to be considered great in the eyes of God. And yet, how should we understand this spiritual greatness. What makes someone great? And then our Lord goes on to say, you know, right in, in the gospel today, I just said it before, I'm going to repeat it again. For I say to you, among those born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist, but he who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. It's a very strong statement. St. John was the absolute epitome of faithfulness and obedience to God. And, you know, as we recall the entirety of, of mankind, of history. And, and he was the one who reached it. He reached greatness. He was the one who in himself personified of what a faithful Jew was supposed to be. He was supposed to be focused and dedicated and obedient to the will of God and to be open to do what God called him to do. All kinds of people through the Old Testament had a close relationship with God. St. John was ahead of all of them. So I'm going to say something that's a little bit controversial. We too are as great as St. John the Baptist, according to the teachings of Christ, because we belong to the kingdom of heaven. St. John had his time and place, right? St. John had his uh, remembrance and his glory, and he's the greatest among anyone born of woman. And yet you and I, right, all of us are regarded as also great in the kingdom of heaven, <clears throat> just like St. John the Baptist. Moses and Enoch and Elijah and Elisha and Joshua and David and St. John the Baptist. None of them had the opportunity for the intimacy with God that you and I have been given. None of them. They do now, but not then, right? Their God was not flesh yet. Their God was not able to, or not um, walking among them yet. Their God had yet to see them and to speak with them and to be with them and to live with them. Their God had not yet taken into himself the human flesh and human nature and human emotions and human psychology and lived their life. Our God has. Not to say they're different gods, right? Don't get, don't get me wrong. They never received communion in their lives. We are offered this opportunity every liturgy that the Eucharist is offered. They have never reached the transforming power of baptism. They have never received the transfiguring power of the Holy Spirit. They never received the, the life-changing energy that comes to us through the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. They never heard the words, your sins are forgiven. 
right? They were never touched with the oil that was blessed by God for the healing of their diseases. All of things that you and I take for granted, I know I do, right? As members of, of Christ's holy church, all of those things, you know, when we reflect on it, those things that I, you know, unfortunately, I don't really prepare for, I, 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 or I lazily prepare for. None of this did the greatest born of women have the chance to participate in. You and I do. And that closeness, that intimacy, God calls us to closeness. God closes, uh, calls us to, to intimacy. And God calls us to repentance. So what does it mean when our Lord Jesus Christ calls us to repentance? I'm sure that most of us knows that repentance means a change of mind, a change of heart moving away from our sinful ways and the ways that, you know, can take us away from God. And we adjust course and we go back to God. Uh, believe me, the, the cynic star today was very powerful. And if you have a chance to read from St. Theodora, the, the story of St. Theodora, uh, it's very powerful. Turning back to God. There might have been a fall, a deep fall, but it's a repentance, a life of repentance to get back on track, to get back on target. Because we know that sin, after all, means missing the mark or being off target. So how do we go about repenting? We talk about repentance all the time in the Orthodox Church, and rightfully so. When our Lord calls us to repent, he is essentially, um, he is essentially you know, describing the entirety of the Gospels. All of the things that he does, all of the things that he teaches is for the purpose of bringing people to repentance, to draw everyone back to him and all the people that have gone astray. And he says in the Gospels of St. Mark and St. Luke, he says, I come, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And he's trying to do the same for us here today. He's trying to encourage us to go back to him. Like we are imagining ourselves to be like the prodigal son. Um, who goes after one passion to the next, who get off track. He's trying to get us back on track. So how do we get back on track? How do we actually change our minds and our hearts? We might say, I need to pray more. I mean, that's probably true for most of us. I know I'm guilty. Maybe the problem is that we don't pray enough for other people, that we focus too much on ourselves and the things that we want. Or perhaps we just don't have that much of a prayer rule at all. Maybe it's been a long time since we sat with their father confession and we haven't had a chance to really develop a prayer rule. Maybe it was strong at one time, but now we struggle to simply even say our morning prayers before we start our day or before we go off to work or log on to work, you know, with this day and age. And so, yes, an increased prayer would be beneficial to help us draw, draw closer to God. Another person might say, we need to change our attitude towards fasting. We have to realize that it's not just about our diet. It's not just about the food that we need to not only cut out the meat and the dairy, but any excess in our lives, right? I was just talking to someone the other day about it. Fasting is not just about being vegan, right? Fasting on Wednesdays and Fridays and the Holy Day fasts and any kind of uh, fast that's prescribed by the church. It's not just about the food. It's about removing anything that's excessive, right? Especially nowadays, Netflix is probably excessive or any kind of social media or streaming and all that kind of stuff. It's might be a little bit excessive. So it might be appropriate to cut down on those things that are excessive um, or even on our smartphones and things like that. Simply living our lives so that we can spend more time focusing on our relationship with God. That's the idea. If we can limit the access and focus on our relationship with God. Another way we might think that we need to change is maybe a greater participation with the sacramental life of the church, which means not missing services when they're, when they're available and when I can rearrange my schedule to make it happen. You know, now, thank God, we're starting to open up a little bit more consistently. We have the Wednesday liturgy as an option with no registration. We have the Friday liturgies. We're going to start. I'm going to announce that in, as part of the announcements. We have the, we have the weekend liturgies, and we're going to try to offer two for the families as much as we can. So whenever there's a liturgy, an, an opportunity to take the body and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ or to participate in the sacraments, we shouldn't be reluctant. We shouldn't be hesitant. And we should try to make whatever we can opportunities to, to participate. Because when we receive the sacraments, we receive the grace of God, which we know is transformative. And so 
Someone else might say, you know, maybe we should study the scripture more or give alms more if we haven't done so, etc. Right? Repenting and changing all of those things can help us draw closer to Christ and to become more like Christ, right? That's the ultimate goal of the Christian life is to be like God. So what is God? God is love. And so we can do all these things. We can pray more. We can fast more. We can come more to liturgy, right? But we have to ultimately ask ourselves the question, what's our motivation for, all, for doing these pious acts? Why are we doing this stuff? Are we doing them out of fear? Because I want to save myself from going to the other place. I don't want to go to hell, right? Or are we doing them out of love? And if we're not doing them out of love, then I'm afraid, guys, we have a problem. So I want to emphasize the real point of the authentic repentance. Authentic repentance must lead us back to the two great commandments. If repentance is all about coming back to God and trying to be like God and following his example, that means ultimately we need to be more loving. And if we repent, if we want to repent, we have to ask ourselves the questions, you know, what can I do to love my neighbor more? What can I do to love my enemy? What can I do to show more love to God himself? What can, I do to, what can I do to be more loving in general? These are the questions that lead to change. This is the path to true repentance. Sometimes I think we get caught up in the details. All the fasting rules, which are important, but not like, they're not God, right? All the fasting rules, checking off boxes, learning the complex theology. There's nothing wrong with that. In fact, it's important. But those things are tools to aid our repentance. They are not an end to themselves right? Um, just because I can memorize a lot of the church fathers doesn't mean that I have the closest to God. We, we have to be careful of those things. But again, I'm, I want a disclaimer, right? Knowing those things are important and they, they, are, they are helpful tools to aid our repentance. So real repentance is about love. And Christianity is about love. And we will be judged by whether or not we loved whether or not we clothed the naked, whether or not we fed the hungry, whether or not we visited the sick or the imprisoned, whether or not we cared for the orphan or the, window, or, or the widows. So the question is, have we done these things? And even if we have, will we continue to do those things and do them out of love? Are, are, you know, we are all lacking love to a certain extent. That's why we have to continually repent. We all do... Uh, things to damage our relationships with each other, whether it be our family or, you know, in the congregation, at work or at school and so on. And so all of it boils down to this. Are we repenting of the things that separate us from God and from each other? The things that are opposite of God are opposite of love, like hate and gossip and lies and judgment. All of those things tear our relationships apart. And the church fathers and the scripture and Christ himself, for that matter, teach us that hatred and condemning others shuts the gates of heaven. The kingdom of love. And so <clears throat> the first condition of true repentance is reconciliation. And I know, guys, with the quarantine and lockdowns and even the air quality lately, we're, we're confined in a very restricted space with people that you know, might be, um, it might be tough at home, right? But we have to work on reconciliation. That's true repentance. That's where the work needs to be done. And that's why we're giving this gospel today. Because we need to focus on repentance. And sometimes I think we really get focused on repentance during Lent or like Holy Week or things like that. But we always need to be repenting. And that's the message that the church is saying from the beginning of the Coptic year. We always need to be repenting so that we're ready to meet Christ at any moment. The kingdom of God is truly at hand, so we need to repent. We need to love. We need to, so that we can partake of the kingdom of heaven. Which brings me to the to Nairus. A few things come to mind when we think and contemplate of the Coptic New Year. We honor millions of martyrs who sacrifice their lives as a sacrifice of love for our Lord who sacrificed himself on our behalf. We joyfully celebrate the beginning of the, Coptic New Year, of the Coptic New Year. We express our eagerness for the second coming of Christ. And so the Feast of Nairuz, 
the feast of the Coptic New Year, is a feast of new beginnings. And, and as we, as with the beginnings of the calendar year, like January 1st, we always assess our lives and we try to think about how we want to do things differently for the new year. New beginnings are, are amazing. And the New Year's resolutions of going to the gym, right, and all those kind of things, like we, we love this stuff. We love fresh starts. And so I want to contemplate a little bit on newness. A new life in Christ entails a fresh start. And when we are about to start a new life in him, we should sever our old selves completely, cold turkey, rip the band-aid, that the, the old self that can hinder us from our progress of that relationship. His grace, um, Bishop Angelos, in one of his talks, he talked about newness. And he said, newness must not be a patchwork, but rather a complete start, something that it is, that it is begun in a way that gives it the ability to grow, a seedling that is planted and given the potential to develop into a beautiful, fruitful tree that gives fruit to all. If we have a patchwork of life, it can easily be torn apart and it's not sustainable. When we attempt to only partially change our lives or we wanna change this one aspect of our lives, we discover very quickly that this change is temporary. We're gonna be met with a lot of challenges. You know, we have seen many patchwork changes over the past months and years. Changes that, you know, desire to take part of, of the old and merge it with the new. We want to have this like blending of the old ways. I don't want to leave that life completely, but I want to start my new life in Christ. Patchwork changes that don't eradicate the old self, um, it doesn't work. We have seen this failing method in our lives and it's very clear it doesn't work. So the question, why do we keep doing it? Newness must be placed on a firm foundation. And so too, we must place our new beginnings on a firm ground. St. John Chrysostom says, it's a little bit of a long passage and bear with me. When you see the year coming to completion, give thanks to the Lord that he brought you to this period of years. Put your heart to rest. Count up the time of your life and say to yourself, the days move quickly and pass by. The years come to an end. We have already transversed much of the road, but what noble thing have we done? We will not go from here empty and lacking all righteousness. The judgment is at the doors. Life presses on and toward our old age. It can be tempting to, to buy into thinking that this year will be same as all other years. And I, God forbid, I really hope not. 2020, it's enough. That since many of the you know, past resolutions have failed, you know, why try a new one? It's just going to repeat itself. You know, I'm just this way. I have these passions and so be it. I'll never change. No, this kind of thinking is pride. It actually denies the reality of the changed lives that we see in the lives of countless sinners that have turned saints in front of us, that who we surround the church with, right? To deny the possibility of growth and healing from passions and sin sickness is to deny the reality of Christ and God himself. It's prideful. So as we wrap up these thoughts, let us take this opportunity today as the Holy Church begins a new liturgical year to start over, to remember the grace that we have received from our baptism and to dwell on the things that are holy and righteous and to worship in spirit and truth, to follow the holy teachings of Christ and to make him the very center point of our lives. We pray that we will become instruments of God's hands. We pray that we will commit ourselves to growth and we pray that we will commit ourselves to a life of repentance. And we pray for a most blessed new year filled with God's grace and his light and his life that we may bear fruit of the kingdom in our life and, and that through our lives, others too may come to know the truth and glory be to God forever. Amen. And so at this point, I would like to